It was, you know, the end of the 60s, the late 60s, and everybody was happy. And we were all so excited, and people were young, and it was just like the best of times. We'd always be at El Coyote. That was our spot. Cass would be there too. You know, Cass Elliott from the Mamas and Papas. Sharon and Roman were deeply in love. They were inseparable. Sharon and Roman were deeply in love. Who told you that? She was more miserable than I'd ever seen her. Polanski was a fucking psycho. He used to throw bricks in Cass's swimming pool and laugh as my dog tried to get them out. I hated him. At the time, I even thought he did it. I was used to this by now. Every time I spoke to someone, I'd find myself reigniting 30-year-old rumors and rivalries. The murders had sundered friendships and revealed strong opinions about the era's morality, or lack thereof. You know, I heard they were Satanists at that their house, and they had demonic orgies. Warren Beatty brought me there one time. He's full of shit. There were never any orgies. Not that I hung around there often. Although, Polanski was a peculiar fella. I was dealing in memories that had survived decades of erosion. My reliable sources were shaky at best. And as for my unreliable sources... Yeah. Man, I heard Steve McQueen brought a gun to the funeral. In case he ran into any Satanists. Can't say I blame him neither. They were mixed up in some freaky shit at that house. I kept reminding myself they were washed up Hollywood personalities. Their memories had warped to accommodate their bruised egos and ulterior motives. I'm telling you, it was all because of the Rosemary's baby curse. Same thing happened to John Lennon. Each one was more convinced than the last that they just had to be at the center of any story worth telling. Stranger still was just how many people refused to speak about it all even 30 years later. Very few of Polanski and Tate's intimates would talk to me. Jack Nicholson said, no. Warren Beatty said, no way, pal. Jane Fonda said, no, get a real job. Hugh Hefner, not interested. Angelica Houston, I don't want to be involved. Paul Newman, nope. Kirk Douglas, or no thanks. Bruce Dern and Diane Ladd, no, and if you even put my name in it, I'll contact my attorney. You know, I must admit, that Polanski crowd was a little scary. There was an aura of danger around them. An instinctive feeling that everyone was pushing it and things were getting out of control. My wife and I still talk about it. You know what they say. Live freaky, die freaky. You know, Peter, nobody else will talk to me. It's like there's some conspiracy of silence amongst the Hollywood elite. That's so interesting. Charles Manson was a lot more plugged into Hollywood than anyone is willing to admit. I'll bet that's why they're not talking. One big player who would speak to me was Vince Bugliosi in 1999, seven years before things soured. I was just wondering, Vince, if Manson wanted to teach Terry Melcher a lesson. Why did he order the killings of people who had no real connection to him? So far, I've found no evidence that Terry Melcher had even met any of the Polanski crowd. The only relation is that they lived in his old house. Uh, yes, it's very sad about what happened to Terry he was very scared and felt very guilty. He was a great guy, a terrific guy. Could you put me in touch with him? Um, well, I think I left his phone number in my other pants, so probably not. Well, is there anything at all you can tell me that isn't public knowledge? Off the record? There is one thing, just between me and you. What is it? Well, uh, Roman Polanski was a total libcuck. He was a libtard, okay? A couple days after the murders, we found a film in his attic of Sharon Tate screwing two men that weren't him. Didn't even look consensual. I told LAPD to put the tape back and never mentioned it because I thought he'd been through enough. I'm a stand-up guy like that. Although I didn't realize it at the time, this was a lie. Vince wasn't assigned to the case until November that year, so he couldn't have found those tapes in August, unless he'd secretly been involved in the case earlier than he'd acknowledged. A few months later, I was able to track down Witold Katsanovsky, who was a friend of Wojtek Frakowski's. Could you tell me what was the atmosphere around the house in the weeks before the murder? The crowds got rowdier and the drugs got harder. I think Wojtek got in over his head that summer. I still close my eyes and I'm back in 1969. I still hear people's voices and I still see their faces. All usual indicators of class and status were gone. The most extreme ugliness was mixed up with total purity. Totally primitive and uneducated people could dress and act like visionary artists. You couldn't tell a Charles Manson from a great poet. So many strange people were coming and going from that house on Cielo Drive. 
there'd be rager parties that lasted for days. I never trusted any of them. They'd walk so freely through the place. Always some friend of a friend of so-and-so. What do you make of Bugliosi's helter-skelter narrative? Well, even to this day, I'm not convinced there weren't other factors at play. Right after the murders, I went into hiding. I thought for sure it was Pick Dawson. I mistook the word pig on the door for pick. Who was Pick Dawson? A drug dealer. He was going out with Mama Cass at the time. Him and his drug dealer buddies would cause trouble at these parties. Polanski had to have them kicked out, and I believe they threatened to kill him one time. My manager told me you stepped on his foot, stumped a cigarette out on his face, and were touching girls. That's totally inappropriate. Take your backpack and fuck off. <laughs> Quit bitching, you little twink. I'm gonna come back and kill you all. He threatened to kill them. How credible do you think this threat was? Well, I felt it was credible enough, all right. Right after the murders, Polanski was put up in an apartment in the Paramount movie lot to be interrogated. I met up with him beforehand and filled him in on what they'd been doing in his house while he was away. I think Wojtek was involved. Mr. Polanski, I'm sorry for your loss. Can you think of anybody who might have wanted to harm your wife? Oh, uh, my who? Your wife, Sharon Tate? What about her? Well, her, she was horrifically murdered a few days ago. Oh, that's right. Terrible shame. Where were you on the night? I was in London location scouting for my next film. Must have been some film to warrant leaving your eight and a half month pregnant wife in a different country. It's about a man who trains a dolphin to assassinate the president of the United States. Cut the crap, Polanski. You expect me to believe that? Everybody knows dolphins only got beef with those nip bastards. Even fish can't forget about Nanjing. Okay, okay. Look, I wasn't there, but I've heard Fakowski wanted in on some big drug deal and was operating out of my house. Wait, what's that noise? Some men just want to watch the world burn. If you could ask Frykowski one last question, what would it be? I'd ask him, did you ever meet anybody from the group that came to kill you? Figuring Polanski's confidants might want to paint him in a better light, I tracked down his old manager who was living in London. He'd never been interviewed before. Thanks for agreeing to meet with me, Bill. Could you tell me about how the Manson murders affected you? The murders unraveled me. I lost my marriage and life savings to a coke addiction. Found myself sleeping in a doorway on Ventura Boulevard. I was a broken man, all right. After time enough, came the calling of the rosary. And I've put myself together as best I could. Got square with God and all. Though I won't feign any goodwill for Polanski. You were Polanski's manager, right? How did it all affect him? Well, O'Neill, there's two versions of this story. Which do you want me to tell? The one about Polanski crying to me in a Bel Air hotel room. You know, Bill, I wish I'd spent more. I wish I'd bought her more dresses. I wish I'd given more gifts. And then there's the other story of Polanski sleeping around in London whilst his pregnant wife was trying to put a life for them together in California. She got murdered because he was busy fucking around in London. So which is it? Poor baby boy Roman Polanski, or the tale of the little prick who left his wife alone with those tragic losers Sebring and Frakowski. Would you say the murders represented a loss of innocence for Hollywood? There was nothing innocent about Hollywood. It was retribution. The only value Los Angeles had at that time was this. He who dies with the most toys wins. I think it's pretty fucking self-serving to call that period and what was going on innocent. What's innocent about drugs? What's innocent about promiscuous sex? You tell me where the innocence was. Within a week of the murders, Polanski was partying up with Warren Beatty. Nobody cared or gave a shit about Sharon Tate. Not cause she wasn't real nice and all, but because she was expendable. Everybody in that fucking town is expendable. You think it all took place the way Bugliosi makes out in Helter Skelter? In L.A. that summer, it seemed like everybody and their mother was a fucking spook. There was this CIA, FBI surveillance aspect to the whole city. Couldn't piss on a tree without a federal agent knowing about it. I don't buy for two seconds that Manson wasn't a well-known player. That summer was a hazy dream. And like most dreams, 
there's a monster at the end of it. And sometimes, I don't think even Charlie Manson was a big enough monster to explain it all. All this talk of cover-ups and more to the story sent me down a rabbit hole. I decided to talk to some of the drug dealers Katzanowski had told me about earlier. I tracked down their ringleader, Charlie Taco, at his retirement home and took him out for pizza. I can't stand to fly on airplanes no more, man. Depresses me. Every time I look at the armrest where the ashtray used to be reminds me how this country's gone to shit. Can't even smoke on an airplane no more without some uppity bitch hostess getting in your business. That's very nice, Mr. Taco, but uh, I was asking if you ever went to any parties at Cielo Drive. Hey, yeah, we partied all right. Me, Billy, Tom, and Pick, we'd crash their little parties and fuck all their women. Price of admission was a nose full of coke and some gay little hippie talk. It was all great fun right till it wasn't. What do you mean, right till it wasn't? Why'd you stop? Billy got fucked up the ass one time. Sort of soured the atmosphere. What? Fucked up the ass? I never got fucked up the ass. Uh, Charlie Taco told me you were sodomized by two of the Manson victims? No, nah, man. That definitely never happened. Oh, he got fucked up the ass all right. He even filed a police report. The Polak fella done it, if I'm remembering. Them Slavic types are all weirdos. Charlie just spread that story around to have a laugh at my expense. Ain't no truth to it. Even my fucking mom was calling me up asking if I was okay. Man, I'm telling you, he got fucked. We brought him to Cass's house and I had to handcuff him to a tree for two fucking days until he was calm. Swearing up and down that he was gonna kill Frankowski. I wouldn't lie about it, seriously. I'm gonna kill him, Charlie! That filthy commie piece of shit! I'm gonna shoot that motherfucker as soon as I get these handcuffs off! <laughs> hey, calm down, Billy. Chill, man. We got the big trip next week. Don't do anything stupid. I'm gonna melt his eyes out with a lighter! Listen, it never happened. But if it did happen, it sure as hell weren't in no gay way or nothing like that. Uh, Billy, I read in an interview from 69 that you yourself told the police it might have happened. You know, maybe I'm remembering something. I think they might have drugged me, but I don't know what happened after that. All I know is when I woke up, I was sore. Squeal for me, nah boy! Squeal, little bitch! Hey, squeal like a hawk! Nah, get out, nah boy, louder! Hey! Squeal! Hey! <laughs> Is there anyone else who can verify this? What about the other two in your group? Pick OD'd in the 80s and I haven't heard from Tom since that Contra fuck up. Probably still running wild in some Nicaraguan black site. What did you think of Polanski personally? Roman Polanski and that Slavic little bum buddy of his Frykowski were communist spies out to subvert Western democracy with decadent sex films. Sounds like you and Billy had plenty of motive. Where were you at the time of the murders? I wasn't in the country at the time. Me and Billy were in the Caribbean. Top secret government mission to get blackmail on Castro and keep Cuba out of Jamaica. At least, that's what I told Billy it was. <laughs> Billy, could you tell me about your supposed trip to the Caribbean? Charlie told me you were involved in a plot to keep Castro out of Jamaica. Dead white men will rip your tongue out if you ever mention that again. The government wants no exposure on the Jamaica thing. There never was a Jamaica thing, understand me? Charlie, are you sure about this? It's for America, son. It's the only way. Remember to take pictures. Well, uh, if you say so. Now, what's your name again? Uh, Marita Lorenz. Go get them, Tiger. What were two drug dealers doing in a Cuban black op? I was never a drug dealer. I was a high-level secret agent, and I reported to Hank Fine. You can look that up. I shot people for the government. I was a marksman. I served in Korea. There's a whole lot of dead gooks that attest to my marksman skills. If only they could talk. <laughs> Uh, but you did sell drugs, did you not? Okay, okay, I was also a drug dealer. I was a lot of things, a renaissance man, a soldier of fortune. I knew a lot of important fucking people that'll turn your ass into Swiss cheese if you don't stop pushing. The community had looked at this Manson crap as a settled thing till you started sticking your nose in it. The community? Which community would that be, exactly? You know, the ties that bind. Billy, I know you were uh, out of the country at the time of the murders, but Corinne Calvert told me you brought Charles Manson to her house one time, and he pissed into her swimming pool. Did you know Charles Manson? 
That bitch Calvet was a groupie of ours. She'll say anything for attention. Uh, Manson didn't piss into her swimming pool. He was already in the pool, and he just happened to piss. Totally not the same thing, man. But you did know Charles Manson. And you were sodomized by two of the victims just days before they were killed. And you did promise to come back and get revenge. That's a lot of coincidences. You know what, man? Who the fuck are you anyway? Just who do you work for exactly? Are you with Polanski? You know what? We're done here. I'm not talking to you no more. My story about Charles Manson so far had very little of Manson in it. It was all a lesson in how a narrative becomes the narrative. It was clear so far that Bugliosi had cherry-picked the facts for his book. I had to keep pushing. The only problem was I owed my magazine editor 5,000 words, and so far, I'd written zero. Discussing foreign trade And she passes looks as well as bills That every 